Well, good evening and good morning and welcome to uh, this week's Bible study. I'm so grateful to God that you tuned in and I pray that all is well with you. I pray that your faith is firm. I pray that your hope is sure and that you're walking in God's love. I pray in the name of Jesus that everything that you need will come to you. And I pray that you will never, ever quit. Never give up. I know that some of you may be facing some uh, severe challenges in your life tonight. But please, dear hearts, don't give up. Hold on to your faith. It may look as if it's impossible. But remember, nothing is impossible with God. You serve a loving, merciful, forgiving, kind God. And his focus is on you. On you, his focus is on you. And somebody say, well, how can his focus be on me and on her and on him and them? God is a big God. And his focus is on you. And everybody could say a prayer at the same time. And God is able to decipher all of the languages, all of the tones, all of the voices, and hear everybody's prayer at the same time. So never forget that, that God is watching you. He's observing you. He knows where you are. And if you hold on to your faith, he's going to bring you forth uh, with a victory. Father, I pray now for uh, everyone who's viewing this Bible study that you would anoint your word today, anoint me to give your word today, and may something be spoken today that would be a blessing uh, to your people that will build them up, that would encourage them to hold on in the midst of the storm. In Christ's name, amen. And again, thank you so much uh, for joining the Bible study. Uh, before we <clears throat> get into the main text, I want to give some, uh, some information about Moses that I should have given uh, in the beginning, but it, 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 it uh, skips me. But I want to give it to you t t today. Uh, 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 Moses' life, according to the speech recorded in the seventh chapter of the Acts of the Apostles by Stephen was divided into three periods of 40 years each. So when Stephen was preaching in the seventh chapter uh, of the book of Acts, he referred to Moses on three occasions. He was in Egypt as a son of Pharaoh's daughter for 40 years. You find that in Acts chapter 7, verse number 23, and Exodus uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. And you'll see that he was in uh, Egypt as the son of Pharaoh's daughter for uh, 40 years. He was in uh, Midian for 40 years. And that's referred to in Acts chapter 7, verse 30, and Exodus 2, 15 through Exodus 4 and 19. And it was 40 years from Egypt to, to the crossing of the Jordan. And he referred to that in Acts 7, 33, and Exodus chapter 4, verse 20 through Deuteronomy chapter 34. So four, three 40-year periods. The, the, daughter, the, the uh, son of Pharaoh's daughter for 40 years, he with, was with that family. And 40 years he was in, <clears throat> in Midian. And it was 40 years between the time of, of his departure from Egypt and the crossing of the Jordan. Tonight we're going to revisit uh, the Passover. The Passover is such a powerful passage of Scripture, and it relates to both the Jewish religion and, of course, uh, Christianity. The first Passover, uh, just before uh, the midnight uh, execution of Egypt's firstborn, the ceremony of the first Passover was observed by the Hebrews. Each household killed a young lamb. And the lamb was between one and two years old. It had to be a young lamb without any spots, without any blemishes. It couldn't have any problems at all. It had to be a more or less a perfect lamb because, again, this lamb was a type, a type of Christ. Uh, they sprinkled uh, the blood of the lamb on the lintel and the doorpost. This sign uh, indicated the house belonged to the Israelis and that the promise was that 
the angel of, of the Lord would pass over and spare the oldest son of the Hebrew of that home. The lamb itself was roasted and eaten the same night without unleavened bread and bitter herbs. This was pointing ahead to uh, the Lamb of God. This is what it was, an unleavened bread simply meant that the bread had no yeast in it. They didn't have time for the bread to rise with yeast in it, so it, it was to be unleavened bread. And so that lamb, again, represents the fact that Jesus Christ uh, is the Lamb of God. We won't turn there for the interest of time, but in St. John chapter 1, verse number 29, John the Baptist saw Jesus, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. You know, when we were children, and in my generation, they would give out these little cards uh, in the Sunday school classes, and um, it would be this white man with long hair, and he would have a lamb uh, in, his, in his arms sitting on his lap. And I don't know what they were trying to communicate, but that had nothing to do with Scripture at all. The Lamb of God simply means that just like Israel had to provide a lamb without a spot, without a wrinkle, without any flaws in it, Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God. God provided himself a lamb. And in the same fashion that the blood of the lamb that was uh, placed on the lintel and on the doorpost spared the lives of the Jews, our lives are spared tonight because of the lamb of God's blood. God provided a perfect lamb to become the sin sacrifice for the believer. You know, we can't talk about that too much because there are so many in the church who have yet to receive the fact that they have perfect salvation because of the Lamb of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want, to, I want to make it clear to you tonight again and again that you and I, we have perfect salvation because of the Lamb that God provided. And remember, the lamb in Egypt was a type of Christ, and Jesus fulfilled that typology uh, in the New Testament. So all of us who have accepted Christ as Savior, then we are now redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Praise God. Now, your life, no doubt, would not be everything you would like it to be tonight, and and we've all had failures and mistakes, but aren't you glad tonight that as far as your salvation is concerned, that you have perfect salvation. Your salvation is absolutely perfect because God the Father is completely satisfied with the blood of the Lord Jesus. Somebody out there ought to tell him, thank you, Jesus. You ought to tell him, praise the Lord. Get that worry off of you. You will not be lost. It is impossible for you to be lost in sin and lost to hellfire as long as you are depending on the blood of the Lamb of God. Remember, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Now, let's move on. Now, <clears throat> let's go to Exodus. Uh, put on the screen for me, Exodus chapter 12, verses 14 through 20. Exodus chapter 12, verses 14 through 20. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an audience forever. Verse 15. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Now remember that bread had no yeast in it and it didn't rise. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out 
of your houses. And that leaven represented ungodliness and unrighteousness of sin. And so in a sense, God is telling them that they were to sanctify themselves in preparation for getting out of bondage. Uh, of uh, seven days shall you eat unleavened bread, even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And sometimes cut off meant that they were to be disciplined, and other times cut off meant that they were to be uh, destroyed. Verse 16. And in that day there shall be a holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. So God was getting them ready to be delivered from bondage in Egypt. And he's giving them clear instructions as to what they were to do to prepare themselves uh, to, to enjoy their deliverance. That's, that's not unlike uh, us today. When you are trying to get yourself untangled from something that, that you want to get away from, sometimes you have to make some adjustments. There are some things sometimes that you must dismiss uh, out of your life. Is that then other times there's some things that you must add to your life. But an adjustment needs to be made, a faith uh, adjustment, a lifestyle adjustment oftentimes is required before God moves in our lives. And that was the incident that, that uh, the experience, I should say, that was taking place with Israel uh, when they were prepared to be delivered uh, from Egypt. The Passover feast is an annual celebration for Israel. New Testament Christians are, the, uh, are, are, are to celebrate the Passover in terms of um, the Lord's Supper. The Jews now, of course, the Jews, they celebrate the Passover around the time of first, uh, excuse me, around the time of Good Friday. They participate every year around the time of Good Friday. But, but we Christians, we don't celebrate Passover as such, but we do celebrate by, uh, by receiving uh, the communion or, or, or the Lord's Supper. Uh, let's look at St. Matthew's chapter 26, verse number uh, 26. St. Matthew's chapter 26, verse number 26. And the Bible says... And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to uh, the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So he was preparing them for what? The communion or the Lord's Supper. Let's also consider 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number uh, 24 and 25. 1 Corinthians 11, 24. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, so now in the same fashion that God told Israel, the, the, the Jewish people, that they were to celebrate Passover with a Seder meal. There's a special meal that the Jews have every year around April and near, I should say, the um, Good Friday uh, 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 that we celebrate Good Friday, and at the same time they're celebrating Passover. They are reminding themselves of how they got delivered out of bondage. They are reminded every year. And God wanted us to be, be reminded 
of how we got delivered out of bondage. In large degree, that's what communion or the Lord's Supper is about. It is for us to be reminded of how our salvation was secured. We were in bondage to sin. Just like Israel was in bondage to slavery, we were in bondage to, to slavery to sin. And just like the lamb that they took the blood and put on the doorpost and they got their deliverance, now we have applied the blood of Jesus to our lives and we too are delivered. And I'm telling you tonight, you that are born again, you are no more in bondage. You have been delivered because of the blood of Jesus. Now, Exodus chapter 12, verse number 11. Exodus chapter 12, verse number 11. The Bible says, And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So uh, on the night of the final plague, the Israelites were to be dressed and ready to leave in a hurry. They were to be dressed and to be ready to leave in a hurry. They were to be ready. Like you and I tonight, we need to be ready. Ready for what? Ready for the greatest Passover of all. And that would be the time when the church would be raptured. Stay dressed, stay ready. And of course, we're not talking about physical dress as far as we Christians are concerned, but we need to be watching and waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially today with all of the things that are going on in and around our world. It would indicate that Jesus Christ could come back any moment today. So stay dressed and stay ready so when he come back, you won't have to go looking for the anointed, the anointing. Remember the 10 versions. Five were foolish and five were wise and, and the wise one had oil for their lamps and the Bible said they all slumbered and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry and when that cry came from the Lord, those women, those virgins that had oil in their lamps, they were ready to go. The women who were not ready attempted to borrow oil from the women who were prepared. They said, oh, no, no, no. You got to go get some for yourself. And in the process of going getting oil, they missed out. Why? They were not ready. Don't let that happen to you. Stay ready. The old folks used to say, if you stay ready, you don't have to, you don't have to get ready. And so again, in, uh, in Exodus, he was telling them, listen, you must have on your clothes. You must be dressed and ready to go because we could leave any moment. The Egyptians would come begging them to leave their country. Every, everything happened as God has said it would. They were begging them to get out. Before, they were seeking to hold on to them, but after God got finished dealing with them, they were ready to tell them to get out and never come back. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 29. Exodus chapter 12, verse 29 and, and on. We'll put in verse 29. And the Bible says, And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive and that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. So he, the, the, the people died and the cattle died. Praise God, man. Verse number 30. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Now, you're talking about some mourning. You're talking about being bereaved. The whole nation of Egypt 
was wailing and weeping that night because everybody in the house had somebody dead. And you could hear the cry, no doubt, all over uh, the city. In verse number uh, 31, and he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord, as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as ye have said, and be gone. And then he says, and bless me also. Finally, it would, seen, it would appear that Pharaoh's got some sense. Those nine plagues didn't break him, but that one plague of death broke him. And he said, you get out of here and take your people, your herds, your flocks, and go, and then bless me in the process because he had come to see that they could not compete with God. Like the man says, their arms are too short <laughs> uh, to box with God. Verse number 33. Verse number 33, uh, yes. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we be all dead men. If you don't go, we're going to all be dead. And you notice the word haste. Go in haste. So therefore, uh, Israel was ready because remember, they were dressed. They were dressed because God let them know, you've got to go in haste. And so why they got a mind to let you go, you need to go. Verse number uh, 34. And the people took their drum before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound in in their clothing upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of the Lord. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiments. So in other words, they're getting ready to leave, but they're not going to leave broke. I guess you would call this reparation. They were getting reparation for all the years that they had worked literally for nothing. In verse 36, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. They got, in other words, they took everything they had. They spoiled them because God gave them favor uh, with the Egyptians. You know, friends, when you get delivered, many times you just don't get delivered. You get delivered with a blessing to go with it. Amen. They got delivered out of Egypt, but again, they didn't leave broken. They didn't leave poor. They left with the silver, the jewels, the golds, the raiments, and everything else they wanted. They spoiled the Egyptians. Thank you, Jesus. And so now, let's get it down to the crossing of the Red Sea. The, uh, the book of Exodus chapter 14 verses 1 through 9. Exodus chapter 14 and verses 1 through 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before uh, Phina Haroth, between uh, Midal, and the sea over against Bezehon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. So what is God doing? He's giving them clear instructions and directions uh, what they, as, they were to, as they were leaving a uh, bondage in Egypt. Verse number three. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. So what is God doing? He is setting them up. He knew that Pharaoh would eventually change his mind. And he would take the position that God's people were trapped. Have you ever been in a situation where everybody thought you were trapped? Sometimes your enemies, sometimes people who are against you and wish you evil, 
will, will, will uh, look at your life and come away with the, this, with the uh, idea that you are trapped and that you can't get out of it. But aren't you glad when God is on your side, there's no such thing as a trap because if need be, God can make a door in a wall. God can open up a way where there appear to be no way. And in this particular case, God is setting Pharaoh up because, again, Pharaoh would, would, would make assessment and he would take the position that they are trapped. Verse number four, verse four. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them and I will be uh, honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord and they did so, that they would know that I'm God. You know, friends, sad to say, but in America today, there are large numbers of people who are anti-preacher, anti-church, anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Bible, anti-Holy Spirit. They're anti-everything that God is about. And I believe uh, strongly that God is going to do some things. It's going to concern, confirm, confirm to the gangster that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And he is Lord. And God's going to prove that he's Lord by doing some fantastic things in our lives. So if you feel like you're hemmed in, if it appears like you can't come out, let me encourage you to know that just like God brought Israel out, he's going to do the exact same thing for you. Chapter 14 of Exodus is one of the most dramatic chapters in the whole Bible. The Lord directed the children of Israel southward uh, to go southward where, and, and where they would be put in a situation where it appeared that they would be trapped. Somewhere west of the Red Sea, they, they traveled. This made the uh, escape seem impossible, but it made the subsequent miracle more marvelous. Pharaoh thought that they were trapped and set out after them with his army of 600 choice uh, soldiers and chariots. He thought he had gotten them in a trap, but not so, because God brought them out. And in the same fashion again, he's going to bring you out. When the children of Israel uh, raised uh, their eyes and saw the Egyptian army marching after them, they were naturally petrified. But they wisely called out to the Lord. Exodus chapter 14, verse number 10 through 14. Exodus chapter 14, verse 10 through 14. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were so afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. That's a word right there. That is a word. When we see trouble coming our way, when we see danger coming our way, it may frighten us initially. But I pray that we won't be so frightened until we forget what we need to do. Yes, they saw Pharaoh coming. They saw them marching after them, and they were greatly afraid. But what did they do? They cried unto the Lord. They began to call on God. And let me encourage us tonight to call on God. We are in a situation in this country where there is a lot of fear and a lot of anger, and it is very dangerous out there. There's a lot of violence. Somebody could just go 51, 50, about nothing. And there are guns everywhere. And, and who knows when some crazed guy, some demon-possessed guy, will just go out and start shooting the way they did up in Boulder, uh, Colorado, just the other day, and the way they did down near Atlanta, Georgia, and other cities also have had mass shootings because people are afraid. 
They are afraid, they are angry, and they are taken out on other people. So this is a time for us. If you are afraid, make sure you remember to call on your God. The Bible told you, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Child of God, don't sweat it. He said in his word, come unto me, all ye who labor, and have it later, and I'll give you rest. God will give you rest. Cast your care on him because he cares for you. Yes, it's dangerous. COVID-19 is dangerous. Mass shooting is dangerous. The racial divide is, da is danger in the land. But we are under the blood. Child of God, you are under the blood of Jesus. Child of God, you are surrounded by the angels of God. Child of God, you have Christ in you, and he is your protector. I was thinking earlier today about, uh, and I haven't preached from this passage for years today, and that is Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want it. It goes on to talk about when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the Lord is with me. He's with us, children of God. But we make sure, we got to make sure we take care of spiritual business. This is no time to be calling minded. This is no time to play church. It is time now to be dead serious about walking uh, with God. Verse 11, verse 11. And, uh, and they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, has thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore has thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Isn't that remarkable? Isn't that remarkable? These people, they, they cried out to God, but, but you wonder the level of their faith. Poor Moses. There they are condemning him and accusing him of bringing them out when all the time it was God who brought them out. If they were going to be upset with anybody, it should have been with God because it was God that brought death to Pharaoh and his people that broke their back and told them to get out. And these are the same people who knew that. And these are the same people who left rich, filthy rich. But now the first sign of danger, what do they do? They attack the leader. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we leaders, oftentimes folks are mad with us when they should be mad with the devil. Folks are questioning us when they should go to God. That's all they needed to do was to go to God. But no, they wanted to attack the leader. Say, Moses, what are you doing bringing us out here into the wilderness? Have you brought us out here to put us in the grave? In other words, you could have left us where we were. It sounds like people who will tell me sometimes, you know, Pastor Hill, I didn't have these many problems when I was a sinner. I'm having more problems now than I did when I was in the world. I'm saying to myself, no, you don't. You're just blind right now. No, you do not. It's a blessing to be with God. But just because we're with God doesn't mean that we're not going to be tested, that we aren't going to be challenged. This is a test for them. But they were so uh, dumb when it comes to spirituality and, and they were so unrighteous that they couldn't capture what was going on in the moment. Verse number 12. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. So there they are again, giving all of these negative statements, speaking negative. We're going to die. We told you to leave us alone. We could have stayed right there and stayed in slavery. And it's so much like the church people today. Some people are so accustomed to bondage. They are so accustomed to being defeated. 
until you bring them out and they want to go back in. But I want to thank and praise God. I'm talking to some people tonight who are glad to be out of Egypt in the spiritual arena. You're glad to be out of bondage. You are glad to be saved. And although you may have some tests in your life, you're not about to complain to God about going back into drugs, back into sexual perversion, back into a bad marriage, back into being broke and sickly. No, sir. Back into being depressed and oppressed and frustrated with your life. Nobody in their right mind want to go back to that. No, we're going to stay in God. Yes, we'll get tested. Yes, we get tried. Yes, bad things happen. Yes, we need God to step in, but we will not go back. I want you to get that in your spirit tonight, that you're not going to go back. You're going to stand in the face of whatever comes against you by faith uh, in Jesus' name. Verse number 13, verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, fear ye not. I'm trying to get somebody tonight to have the same position. Fear you not. Don't be afraid of what's going on. Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, they were speaking words of fear, words of doubt, words of unbelief, talking about going back to Egypt. But my man Moses, my man Moses, and of course, a few weeks prior, Moses was a weak guy. I remember Moses was complaining about he couldn't speak and he was complaining about uh, the Jews wouldn't hear him and Pharaoh wouldn't hear him and, and he couldn't do it. But God had prepared Moses, had had Moses 40 years in the desert being a shepherd to sheep and God had let Moses see that burning bush and God allowed Moses to see his rod and God had allowed Moses to, to, to participate in all 10 plagues. Now, Moses now is a veteran in faith. His faith is firm. His faith is sure. He sees the same thing they saw, but he saw it through God's eyes. They saw it through their eyes. You know, friends, may I tell you tonight, you must see things through God's eyes. See things through the, through the prism of the word of God See things the way God sees them through his principles. And then you won't be shaken. Look what he says. Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord or see the deliverance of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The man is talking bold. Brother Moses Praise God for him tonight. The man is talking faith. The man is confessing what's going to happen. Say, brother, say, sister, are you facing something in your life tonight? And if you are, what are you saying about it? Are you poor-mouthing? Are you negative? Are you criticizing the situation? Or are you saying things like, I'm coming out of this? I may be surrounded by trouble. It may look bad for me. I may, I may have gotten bad news from the doctors, but I'm going to stand on the word of God. And in the name of Jesus, I'm coming out of this more than a conqueror. You got to be like uh, Paul and Silas who were locked down in jail. But oh, the Bible said at midnight, they begin to pray and sing praises to God with their backs laid open. They were hurting in that jailhouse, but they did not get into physical pain, and they did not get into looking at their surrounding. They focused on God, and what did God do? Sent that earthquake, shook the doors open, and set his preachers free. Somebody is going to praise God tonight. Somebody, somebody I'm talking to tonight, you are going to begin to speak words of faith over your life. You are going to begin to say, the Lord is your shepherd and you shall not want. You're going to begin to say that the Lord is the strength of your life and you're not going to be afraid. You're going to say, God is with me. Christ is in me. Christ in me, the hope of glory. 
And just like Moses made statements of faith, you too, dear brother, you too, dear sister, you're going to make statements of faith. You may have gotten weak, but tonight you're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Hey, glory to God. He's able to keep you. Look what happened. All of those plagues, all ten plagues that came on Egypt, but not a one went to Goshen. I believe in my heart that had the church been living holy and walking in God's love when this pandemic came to America, the church would have said, we ain't got nothing. We, we, we're healed by faith in the Deborah in the name of Jesus. And let's believe God to do some miraculous healing for the saints of God so we can show the Christ haters, the church haters, the preacher haters that Jesus Christ is God, that he's Lord. Amen. Verse 14, verse 14. The Lord shall fight for you. <laughs> oh, praise God. Praise God. The Lord will fight for you. I'm thinking about uh, <laughs> how God told uh, uh, them in the Old Testament in the 20th chapter of Second Chronicles when God told the people of God, you don't need to fight in this battle. I'm going to fight for you. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. God's going to fight for you. You're going to hold your peace. Verse 15, verse 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whereof Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. Moses, don't be crying to me. You go tell those people that we are going to move forward. Is there anybody tonight that's going to, going to move forward? Are you going to move forward? What about you, dear brother? What about you, sister? Are you going to keep moving forward? Are you not going to allow fear of COVID, fear of violence, fear of diseases, fear of losing your home, fear of losing money, fear? Nothing's going to be, no fear is going to be able to live inside of you tonight, brother. Verse number 16, verse 16. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Another God is saying, listen, Moses, I need you to get involved. I want to work, but I need you to work with me. Do, do you get the picture tonight that God needed Moses to use the faith method that he'd given him? He'd given him that rod. And he needed Moses to stretch that rod out so God could move. I'm telling somebody tonight, God is in need of you stretching out on faith to give God something to work with. Hallelujah to God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We walk by faith and not by sight. According to your faith, uh, be it unto you. And so God would let Moses know, Moses, I've given you a rod, and I need you to use it so I can do my thing. If you do your thing, Moses, I'll do mine. You operate in faith, and I'll operate in power. That's the same thing he's telling somebody tonight. You release your faith, God's going to release his power. You release your faith, God's going to release his supply by faith. Uh, in the name of Jesus. Next verse, next verse, verse 17. And I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will give me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, upon the chariots and upon the horses, and I'm going to get glory out of this. Verse 18. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh upon his chariots and upon his horses. I'm waiting anxiously for God to show the gangsayers of America that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's going to do something for us, thanks to God. God's going to move in a mighty way 
and he's going to show the people that God is who he says that he is. Now, let's, now, let's, let's move to the 14th chapter, verse number 19. Now, the verse 19, Exodus 14 and 19. The angel of the God took his place as a pillow of cloud at the rear of the host of Israel, protecting them from the Egyptians. The pillow of cloud of fire provided light for the Israelites and darkness for the Egyptians. Verse 11, 14 chapter, verse 19, excuse me. And the angel of the Lord, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went before them, and the pillow of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Verse 20. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to thee, so that the one came not near the other all the night. In other words, God says, I'm going to protect you from your enemies. Somebody needs to know that God has been protecting you for a long time. I'm talking to folks tonight. You could have been dead how many times? You could have been out of here. But God put a buffer between you and the devil, and he would not let him touch you. We serve a good God, and I guarantee you, until it's time for you to leave this planet, you're not going to die until God says so. He will put a buffer between you and death. He will put a buffer between you and the devil. The devil would love to get his hands on you, but he can't because God will put a fence around him, around you. I'm reminded when the devil wanted to get a hold of Job, that God had built protection, had put a hedge around Job. I, I believe all of us in the body of Christ have a hedge around us. Don't you know that if the devil could, he kill you tonight. He hates you. He hates everybody, but he really hates people like you and me because we are always going around magnifying Jesus. That makes the devil mad. We're going around here talking words of faith and words of hope and words of love, and we're walking with God. That causes the devil to be angry, but he can't get to us. No, 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 no. He can't get to us without permission uh, of from God. Next verse, next verse, 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Can you imagine going through the midst of the ocean on dry ground? Wasn't even muddy? That's, one, that's the greatest miracle in the Bible, it, it, with the exception of, of, of the raising of Jesus from the dead, of course. Verse 22. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Now, later on, these Israelites, these Jews, are going to act up again. But what's wrong with them? You're walking through the midst of the Red Sea on dry ground, water walled up on both sides. You got to see it. That didn't shake you. That didn't touch you. They, just, they were just like many today. God can heal them of cancer, and then they get, a, get diabetes, and they're scared they're going to die. God can open a door and make a way for them, and then they're afraid they're going to lose it. God give them a home, and, and they know God gave it to them, and now they are afraid that they're going to lose it. Why? Because we forget. We need to remind ourselves continuously of how God has blessed us in the past. Some of us need to keep a journal. Get you a journal and write down every time God does something for you. Record it so that when you're going through a dark time in your life, you can get that journal and open it up and begin to read things to remind yourself of how good God has been in your life. Next verse, next verse, 23. 
And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all the Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Verse 24. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillars of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. 25. And the Lord, and, the, and he took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against uh, the Egyptians. Too late. Too late. You should have seen that. You Egyptians should have seen that with the ten plagues. And you should have seen that with the death in your families. But you were blind and your leader was hard-hearted and stubborn. That got you into trouble. But now you recognize that God is fighting against you, but it is too late. Friends, may I tell you, there's a verse that said this. Touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. When folks are messing with you, don't get into a test. Don't, don't try to hurt them. Don't fight them back. Tell God about it. Because at some point, God may get tired of them messing with you, and God will step forward and bring you out more than a conqueror. Now, let's move, let's move on. Verse 26. Verse 26. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. Again, God and Moses are working together. God said, I'm going to bring the water back, Moses, but I need you to stretch out the, your hand over the, the sea, and I'll bring it back. Verse number 27. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength. When the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Not the Jews, but God fought for them. Verse 28, 28. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Not a one escaped. God took care of all of them. Verse 29. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians are being destroyed, but God's people are being protected. Verse number 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Like Moses said, you go see these Egyptians and you're not going to see them anymore. And that's exactly what happened. Last verse, last verse. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord had, the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Then, then, when they saw that power, when they saw that great miracle, the Bible says the people began to fear God or to reverence God and to believe God and to believe in his servant. I pray tonight that everybody I pastor, I pray that you would reverence God, that you would fear God. I, pr I pray that you would know that your God is a consuming fire and that your God can do anything. I pray that you would reverence him I pray you won't complain against him nor me. Don't blame God and don't blame me. Blame sin and Satan. And I pray that your faith would be firm in God. I pray that God has done enough in your life to let you know that it may look bad, but God's going to bring you out more than a conqueror. I trust that you've enjoyed the word tonight, and I'm praying for you that your faith will be strong in God. I'm praying that no matter what you're facing, 
that you will not break down and begin to cry and whimper just because things aren't going the way you want them to. I would close by telling you this. The most important factor for you as a Christian is for you to focus on obedience. Focus on obeying God. Because I tell you, dear heart, when you obey God, you put yourself in position for God to do spectacular things in your life. He is a miracle worker. So let me encourage you. Focus on today. Keep your mind on God. He said in his word, I will keep thee in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. And the Bible says, if you walk up right before him, no good things would he withhold from them who walk up right. Did you know that? No good things will God withhold from you nor I. If we walk up right, don't allow the devil to put a wedge between you and God. Hold on to your faith. You have the faith. God has dealt to you the measure of faith. You can do it. I don't care how many times you've had failure. Get up and try again. It's not the falling down, but it is the getting up one time more than you fall. If you fall 10 times, get up 11. If you fall 12 times, get up 13. If you fall 20 times, get up 21. At some point, you are going to learn to stand up. You can do it. You have the grace of God in your life. You have the blood of Jesus in your life. You have the Holy Ghost in your life. And you have the Bible, the promise book. You, you are going to be just fine. Father, I want to thank you tonight for everyone who's viewing this teaching. I pray in Jesus' name that you give us all an expansion in our spirit. Enlarge our capacity to believe. Enlarge our capacity to carry the anointing and power of the Holy Ghost. Fill us with faith, hope, and love. Bless us to love and to forgive and to have mercy and to stay faithful and committed and dedicated to your word and your way. In the name of Jesus, forgive everybody who has fallen. As a matter of fact, if you agree with me tonight, and you have allowed something to come uh, into your life that you know is not of God, let's seize the opportunity tonight and ask God for forgiveness. Come on, sir. Come on, ma'am. Open your mouth and say, Heavenly Father, that's right. Say, Heavenly Father, I have made a mistake in my life. I'm sorry for allowing sin to come into my life. According to your word, you will forgive me if I ask you. And so I ask tonight, please forgive me for my sins. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me with your word. Fill me afresh with the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Now, dear brother, dear sister, begin to thank God for forgiving you and watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. You can stand. And those of you who may not be feeling well in the body, I pray for you tonight that God would heal your body. If I had my way, he'd heal you tonight. And I'm asking God to honor my faith and that he would heal your body because I love you. Father, I love this people. And Father, I would like to see them healed. Would you do me a favor, Father? And would you heal my brothers and sisters, of whatever is ailing them. Father God, I know you have the power. You could do it if you would. I, if I could, I would, because I love them. But Father, you love them much more than I. And by faith, I confess that you are healing somebody tonight in the name of Jesus. Thank you for healing this brother. Thank you for healing this sister in the name of Jesus. And those who have been troubled by devils and demons, we cast the devil away from you. Demons and devils must go. We plead the blood of Jesus over you and we pronounce favor and blessings and prosperity over your life. And I confess over you tonight 
that you will be faithful in reading and studying and meditating in the Word of God. You will be an individual of prayer and prayer and fasting. And you will live holy. And you will love everybody. And you will be anointed with the glory and the power of the Holy Ghost. You will pay your tithe. You will give liberal offerings. And financial abundance is coming to you. And every door that's supposed to open will open for you. No weapons formed against you shall prosper. And in the name of Jesus, you are going to walk in that word and overcome every evil spirit, every demon, every devil. You're going to be victorious, my brother and my sister, in Jesus' name. Well, God bless you tonight. Now, of course, I'm asking you uh, as visitors and as friends and in members, would you send an offering in tonight? If everybody have, who have not paid their tithe this week, pay your tithe this week. Pay them now. Pay your tithe. And those of you who are watching, if everybody would send the small sum of a $20 offering, do you not know it would almost pay for television for this whole week? It could do it. If, if I could get, well, let me back up. Those of you who were ministered to tonight, if God gave you a word tonight, all doing this teaching, if you heard anything that inspired or lifted you, then would you send at least a $20 offering? You could do it. And some of you could do more to, to plant seed in this anointing. I'm anointed of God. The Holy Word is anointed. And I believe somebody's been blessed tonight. So, Father, I pray now for every person who's viewing this broadcast that you would touch their hearts to become a financial supporter tonight, both visitors and members tonight. And as they plant this seed, I'm believing for something wonderful to happen. I challenge you tonight, put an assignment on your seed and plant it and watch God move in your life. Read your Bible fast and pray. Fast and pray and read your Bible. Those of you who are fasting with us from Monday night until tomorrow noon, hold on just a few more hours and it will be over. It's been a challenge, but hey, I thank and praise God for the great benefits that come out of it. I love you. Be blessed. Be safe out there. In Jesus' name. Thank you for attending Loving Unity Christian Fellowship on today. We would like you to participate in this time of worship in giving. You can utilize text to give Ministry One app, or go to loveandunity.org. If you would like to text, please text the word GIVE to 310-507-1181. Or you can use our new church Ministry One app by going to your Play Store and ordering Ministry One app. It's free. Or go to loveandunity.org, L-O-V-E-A-N-D-U-N-I-T-Y dot org. And you can give there. Thank you so much again for joining us here at Love and Unity Christian Fellowship. You're going to have a good time.